Good morning. Hey, it's good to be here. Hey, I'm so excited that uh, this year is passing by so fast, and in two weeks, we're going to be celebrating Easter. So I just want to encourage you as your pastor and fellow journeyer on this way of the cross that we're on together in Jesus, that uh, come and celebrate with us and uh, make this a point of uh, high interest for you, and uh, I know you guys will, and we always do, and it's exciting. And maybe for you at home, uh, maybe you've been watching, you found us online, and uh, you've been following along with us and become part of the family. If you're within driving distance, why don't you come this year and celebrate with us as the family of God, gathering together where Jesus is. And maybe some of you have been away for a long while because of uh, the health reasons, but maybe it's time. Ask the Lord, and uh, if this is a time for you, maybe to celebrate Jesus, because uh, it's been a long, long time, and uh, you're, you're, I know you're wanting to be back in the, the celebration of Christ. So we're going to have a great time. I'm going to bring a special message uh, just for Easter. We're going to pause uh, Revelation for that week, and you can bring your friends. I want you, family, friends, uh, you don't have to worry about them getting scared about trumpets and seals and wrath and all those other things. Uh, they can come and hear about how wonderful Jesus is and the power of his resurrection. Although those are all good things and it, we're happy hearing about them because that's what God said. Uh, I think we also got some special music and even a special choir this year. So you don't want to miss that. And uh, it's just going to be a great day of celebration. I just want to pack the house here and at Middletown. All the service times are the normal. You don't have to have reservations this year. And so maybe if you want a little smaller gathering, try out Middletown. Middletown is an amazing place. It is so beautiful down there. Amazing people and great congregation. And it's a, a little bit smaller. And so you can go down there and maybe you'll feel a little more comfortable. Whatever. Uh, try Middletown. It's an amazing spot. So God bless you, Middletown, as we uh, get ready to celebrate. Hey, today we're getting into our series on the book of Revelation. And we've been going through step by step. And uh, for the sake of time, I won't review those because it's quite extensive. But today I'm going to be speaking about the prophetic fulfilling signs. Prophetic fulfilling signs. And prophecy is where God has spoken to us. Revelation is prophecy. It's all about what is going to happen in the future. Uh, but prophecy, God has been giving since the very beginning of Genesis, even in the garden. Many of the things he was saying to Adam and Eve were prophetic and speaking of the coming Messiah. And all through the prophets, all through the scripture, you know, some people are trying to say, well, the Old Testament is just old and that's just some history and it's not important. It's very important because it's prophecy speaking of the coming Messiah and God fulfilling everything in there. That everything in there was a type and a shadow, a symbol to us so that we might understand when the fullness of Christ came. So uh, get, that's why we love all the scripture and tie them together. So today we're entering into a chapter. I think I'm going to be able to cover most of chapter 12. Uh, and chapter 12 is very interesting because it introduces several characters that are introduced as signs, some images. And a sign is what God does, a supernatural thing he does that is, looks like something you would understand but has spiritual meaning and depth and it's meant to bring us a message from God. And so when you see God say this is a sign, well, you know he's trying to communicate something special to you. So that's what we're going to see in there. So let's get into the scripture. As we come to Revelations chapter 12 and verse 1, we see the first sign is a woman with a crown of 12 stars, and that is the picture of Israel. That's the representation of Israel, and I'll show you in just a moment. Revelations 12, 1, it says, a great and a wondrous sign appeared. And I put in your notes there just to let you know what uh, the word sign meant and what God was trying to do. It's a supernatural communication from God. It appeared in heaven. And now remember, this is John the Apostle. He is captured. He's on the island of, of, of Patmos all by himself in prison. And now he's 
captured by God, instructed by Jesus to record these things, and he's taken up into heaven and given glimpses, and now God is showing him what the future is going to be, what's going to unfold. Jesus wants you to know what is going to happen in the end, how he's going to bring it to an end, and how we don't want to be here. We want to be prepared and under his blood and in his relationship so that we're safe in heaven and out of here, but the, the world is going to come under his judgment. And it says that this great sign appeared in heaven, and it was a woman clothed with the sun. Now, put in there, uh, the woman, it's literally, the the word means woman. But in the meaning, I also included this week to let you know that it's a religious system, and it represents Israel. Throughout the book of Revelation, Jesus uses women just for, for communication purposes, not throughout the Bible, but he uses when he several different times a sign of a woman, and it represents every time a religious system. And in this case, it's Israel because he's talking about the crown of 12 stars on her head. And she was pregnant, and she cried out in pain about to give birth. Now, let me give you some other examples. If you're fast note takers, you can do that, or you can go back and re. re- we watch it, re-watch this message on our w- website in full. But here, this woman represents Israel, who was always seen as the wife of God. And that's why God referred to Israel, you're my beloved. You know, even at one time when he was talking about them being unfaithful to other gods, he referred to it as a wife being unfaithful to a husband. So that's what Israel was, this, this woman here. And in another case, we saw earlier in chapter 2, remember Jezebel was mentioned. And it wasn't just as an individual, but Jezebel represented false religion to us. Again, another religious system. We'll see later in chapter 17, there will introduce to another sign to us, which will be a woman, which is a harlot. And a, a, like a prostitute. And there it represents the apostate church, a church that's fallen away, who are in name only, they're not following after God. They're, they're not, they're, they're, they're vile and impure. And then we see, continuing back, including in chapter 19, another woman is introduced, and that is the bride. And that represents the religious system of the church, the bride of Christ. So each one of these represent a religious system. And here we find it Israel with these 12 stars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And this child that's going to be birthed out of her. Now we see this in uh, what I'm doing too in each of these. I'm showing you what Revelation is saying. And I'm showing you where at least one scripture, this was prophesied very uniquely in the Old Testament. So you see the connection of the two. And there are many other scriptures, but I'm trying to keep it just to this one. So the Old Testament, we see it in Jeremiah 23 and verse 5. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David's a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. And and In the NIV there, they actually capitalize branch and king because it's seen as a title, as a name for Jesus. And that's what he's speaking of. And then it goes on that he says, and in this day, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. He's speaking of this Messiah. This, This is a prophetic messianic verse. And he said, this name will be the Lord our righteousness, which is Christ. And so what we see over and over again is that through the promises, even David was given a promise, that through your lineage, through your bloodline, will come a ruler. And he was speaking prophetically, not only did Solomon come out, but he was speaking, he says, and he will rule a kingdom without end, meaning the eternal kingdom of God. And sure enough, where did Jesus come out of? out of the lineage of David. And that's what this is also promising. And that's what it's speaking of, is this Messiah who's coming on the scene, and he's coming back on the scene, because now he's coming again to to get his church and to judge the world in all its power. So this first sign is a woman with a crown of 12 stars representing Israel. 
And the second is the great red dragon representing Satan. It said in verse 3 of Revelation, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and an enormous red dragon with seven heads. And when you look at, remember, the word seven means complete. That's what God is always saying. And heads throughout the scripture always represents that of authority. In other words, a headship, authority, a man's headship in a home. and a, all, Headship is always representing authority. So here is this dragon who's going to be given complete authority. And then ten horns. And in that, this is representing ten kingdoms. And I'll show you why, because it's very clear prophesied why. But there are about ten kingdoms. And what the scholars, when you put it all together, is that in the last days, there is going to be a revival of ten nations who are going to somehow coalesce together under ten different leaders, ten kingdoms. And some believe, and they call it the revived Roman Empire. Now, I am not sold that it has to be exactly where Rome ruled at one time or whatever, but, you know, it's going to be probably in that region, and they're going to coalesce together, and one of their great things is going to become to persecute and attack Israel, to kill the Jews and destroy Israel, and they're going to come together under these, these ten different nations and kings, and that's what we, and I'll show you why in just a minute. But he has these ten kingdoms, and he had seven crowns. And the word seven, complete, and crown is always the rule of a kingdom. It represents a king who can rule a kingdom. And there's coming a time where there will be this person, this beast, the Antichrist, will rise up and have complete rule of all the kingdoms under the earth. Number four, verse four, his tail swept a third of the stars, which are always fallen angels in Revelations, they're angels that either come down as God's angels or, or Satan's angels. And we saw that, if you don't remember that, go back and watch some of the other messages. You'll see they still apply here. Because out of the heaven, out of the sky, they were flung to the earth. Now, I believe that's why these represented, or the angels of Satan, uh, his uh, group. And it says, the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that he might devour her child the moment it is born. Throughout the beginning of time, Satan has hated mankind, and he has hated God, and he has hated the Christ. He has hated the promised Messiah who would become ultimate ruler. Satan wanted to rule, and he knows the Messiah. So throughout history, from the very beginning, he has always tried to destroy the Jews, and he's tried to destroy the Christ. And in fact, throughout history, I believe that's one of the reasons he has such a hatred for the Jewish people because he believes if he kills Jews, those are potentially birth parents of the Christ. The, he knows there's coming a Christ. He knows there, there was a Christ. He believes there's a Christ. And he knows that somehow there, maybe, I don't even know, maybe he's somehow thinking there's going to be another because he knows he's coming again. I don't know why, but he has had this hatred for the Jews. You remember... When Jesus was born, and uh, Herod the king, filled with the spirit of Antichrist, found out that he was born in Bethlehem, the wise men went there, and then later when they ran away and didn't tell him, he sent an army there to Bethlehem, and they killed every male child that was two years old and under, because he didn't know exactly when this time frame happened. And so he was trying to kill the Christ that was in, in this lineage. And that's, that's the heart cry of Satan. That is what he ultimately comes down to. That was the Antichrist spirit and Hitler. That's the Antichrist spirit. Throughout, if you study the Jewish history, we think, a lot of you think it's just Hitler and Germany. The Jews have been persecuted throughout history. Just go look it up and you can see it. Thousands and thousands of years, they've been driven from country to country to country. They've been tormented and persecuted wherever they go. So this is, we see this red dragon coming up. Now, in Daniel, Daniel had a vision, and Daniel was seen in the future into these last days. So this is 500 years before the birth of Christ, and now it is here 2,000-something years later. In Daniel 7, 7, he said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast. Again, he was seeing signs and images not representing 
a real beast, but a sign that was speaking, which again is what we see here. This fourth beast, terrifying, very powerful. It had large iron teeth that crushed and devoured its victim, and it had what? Everybody say ten horns. Again, here's these ten horns prophetically speaking, and now John's seeing the same thing coming to pass. And now later we see exactly what those ten horns represent because in Daniel, just a few verses later, chapter 7, verse 24, it said the ten horns are ten kings. So it's, it doesn't like, well, I wonder what that means. He gives us the understanding, and that still applies today. There are ten kings who will come from this kingdom, and after them another king will arise, uh, different from the earlier ones, and then he will subdue three kings. And so Daniel was already seeing that there's going to be this rise, this revival of these nations that are going to coalesce together, these ten nations, these ten kings, and then there's going to be one that's going to rise up and he's going to take charge, which is the Antichrist, the beast, where he comes in and takes control of the world and, uh, and it, singularly, it becomes the one who is worshipped. So we see the woman is, is Israel, the dragon is Satan, and now we see the child is Christ. Revelation, we continue reading in our passage, verse 5, she gave birth to a son, and the she in this place is Israel. When you're looking at it, this is the woman that we've been speaking of. So Israel gives birth to the son, which is Jesus, the Christ, a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Now, this is a unique statement, like rule with an iron scepter. And I say that because we're going to see that from a prophecy. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. I see all of this is like prophetically God is speaking to us in this one passage of Scripture, and he does that many times, and sometimes between one and two Scriptures, might be thousands of years he sees this happening then at Christ's birth and the devil trying to kill him and, and his resurrection and also that w what we see him taking up to God in heaven there. And her child was snatched up to God into his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared to, for her by God where there's this place of protection where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Now, if you do the math on that, that's three and a half years. Now, what God is speaking to us is Israel, it, who gives birth to the Christ, which has been promised. She's going to enter a period during these last days when these this visions are also coming, not just the picture of what happened when Jesus was here, where she's going to find this place of peace for three and a half years in the tribulation. And that's what all scholars do believe, that the tribulation period is a period of seven years that once it starts... There's three and a half years that are pretty good. There's a covenant of peace with Israel. Then something happens, and then all hell breaks loose, and it's total destruction of coming from the Antichrist on Christians and Jews. And so we see this prophesied. That's what uh, John is seeing in this vision. He's wanting us to know it's true. This is what's going to happen. Psalm 2.9, also a messianic uh, uh, prophet, uh, Old Testament prophecy, and, it's, and he's speaking there, and, and just for the sake of time, I give you the one scripture, but he says, you will rule with an iron scepter, and the you there is the Messiah. That's what he's talking about in this whole passage. The one that they're describing is the Messiah, who we now know to be Jesus. You will rule them with an iron scepter. There's that very unique statement that talks about Jesus. That ultimately, he came as the lamb, the gentle one to, you know, be loving and kind and, and all that sacrificial. But he's going to come back as a judge, and he's going to rule, and there is going to be no deviation. There's no, be no wandering away from the, from the things of God. He will have all authority. And it says that they, he will rule. Verse 10, therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, meaning reverence and total awe, and rejoice with trembling. And then verse 12, for his wrath can flare up in a moment, and blessed are those who take refuge in him. So we see Jesus is being portrayed as this ruler with an iron scepter who wrath will ultimately be poured out, 
and that, uh, but those who take refuge in him, he's still merciful, still caring and protecting us. But there's this promised period of the woman, Israel, being cared for for three and a half years. Now, Daniel saw this again in chapter 9 and verse 27. And it's he, and the he there is the Antichrist or the beast, is in this passage, this one who's going to rise to power. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. And that's this seven-year period. He's going to come up on the scene, this world leader, human, that comes and starts operating with supernatural influence and power. He's going to coalesce the ten kingdoms. He's going to ultimately take control of those ten and ultimately the world. And he comes to a place and it looks, all the other scriptures put together, that he's going to declare a a peacetime. And maybe even during a severe war, there may be a nuclear war before we get taken out of here or some other kind of terrible thing going on. And he's going to become the answer and all the world's going to look to him. But for seven years, he's going to declare this covenant of peace. And in the middle of the seven, which if you do the math, is three and a half years again, confirming these dates, he will put an end to the sacrifice and an offering, and on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out for him. Now, what this means, along with other scriptures, and the scholars all agree on this, is that there's coming a time when this world ruler will come on the scene and there he will once again seem to be promising peace even to Israel. And there will be a period of time, just like she was in the desert and taken care of, the three and a half years, and the temple will be rebuilt. Now, this is like mind-boggling to us. And a few years ago, we thought that's totally impossible. But the way the world's changing, nothing's impossible. But in this atmosphere, this temple, the original temple will be rebuilt sacrifices will begin to be offering and all the the priests and the sacrifices and the blood and the things that they did will begin to be reinstituted by Israel. They become a world leader power. And what you see is though, but what happens is in the middle of this, in the three and a half years, he's going to set up this abomination in the temple. And what most scholars believe that to me is he will probably then erect a statue, an idol of himself. And then that's where he's causing the whole world. You will come and bow at me and my idol or you will die. And that's when he, he brings the hammer down on Israel and begins to kill them uh, unmercifully and attack them. And so that's the, the, the unfolding though. Uh, this Christ is in this picture and the rebuilding of the temple. Then he goes on and, and uh, we see this other revelation of Satan, which is the ancient serpent, but he's being cast from heaven. Revelations 12, 7, and there was a war in heaven with Michael and his angels. And Michael is an archangel, which means there, there were at least several. There was Michael, Gabriel, and Satan, who were all very powerful angels under or over authority over thousands or millions of other angels. And Satan's angels rebel. Now Michael here is in this war with him, and they're in heaven. And his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. And the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. And so... Jesus wants us to understand when he's talking about this serpent and this ancient dragon, it's clearly that he gives him two, he gives him a generic title, the devil, and then he gives him his personal name, which is Satan. That this individual uh, archangel is the one who's being defeated and thrown down, who leads the whole world astray and he's hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now, when you see this, we see this prophesied Old Testament, Daniel again, chapter 12 in verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. 
So I told you before about the book of life, and some think that's just a kind of New Testament uh, theology, but it's not. It's been since the beginning of God's planning with Israel that he always had a book, and the people that were saved had their name in the book. And that's what he's saying here, and we now as believers will be grafted in, and our names are now in that book. But there's this great battle in there with Michael and the prince, and we see Satan being cast down. And it really kind of brings to light, as I meditated on this and did some reading, the thought of Satan has been in heaven. He's been accusing us before the throne. He has access to God, and that's what the scriptures say. I'll show you in a moment. But now all of a sudden he loses that access. He is completely thrown out of heaven, thrown to the earth. Think the rage, the fury that he's going to unleash upon the earth upon mankind, and especially the Jews and the Christians. He has got such hatred and venom, and the attack is going to be just uh, overwhelming. We see millions and millions of people being killed, and they have to bow to the beast uh, or be killed. So now we see that this, this ancient serpent, he's cast from heaven. Now we come to the last part of this that I want to share this morning. But in the midst of all this, we see that Satan is defeated, he's thrown to earth, but he tells us we can overcome him, that we don't have to worry about this enemy, even though he's been cast down, even though now he seems powerful, he seems destructive, the spirit of the Antichrist, yes, there is persecution, there's death, there's plague, there's wars and, and killings, and all that's going on, and it will continue to go on, but that's not the tribulation, because you've been hearing about just some of it so far. But what we see is God has given us this powerful revelation of the victory we have. And we see it in Revelation 12, 10. He says, Then I heard in a loud voice in heaven say, Now, we have, co now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night, that's what Satan has been doing, has been hurled down. The scriptures clearly tell us here that uh, Satan is in heaven. He hates you, and he's been up in heaven saying, you know that, Pastor Steve, he thinks this. He did this. You remember when he was 20 years old, he did this. You remember when he did that, he thought this. He said this. He's, you know what, he flubbed the dub. He's messed up, and man, he's no good. And what Jesus, we see in another place, our high priest is in interceding, saying, no, that's not the way it is. That's my child. That's my son. That's my daughter. She's covered with the blood, and her sins are washed away. What sin are you talking about, devil? Amen. You know, that's what's going on in heaven. And finally, God says, enough of that. You're, you're no longer even going to have that access. So he, he cast him down to heaven. But now let's go on. Then he gives us this amazing, short, but powerful statement that we overlook. Verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony and did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. And there it is, that revelation. He is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. Now here he says we can overcome. And what does he do? He gives us uh, several things there that are connected together. And I just want to spend these last few minutes explaining. Number one, how do you overcome? By the blood of the Lamb. Well, what does that mean? Well, we know from Romans 3 and 22, uh, hundreds of other scriptures, that the righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through what? Faith in his blood. Faith in? Faith in? You see, sometimes we say, I have faith in Jesus. Well, this says faith in his blood, that we understand what is happening and the transaction, as Pastor Forrest was talking about. It's just amazing that, that here we are on Communion Sunday, and the songs, and we didn't organize this, are all about the cross and the blood and everything else, and we see that this, this is an amazing revelation, the blood of the Lamb. 
He didn't say the blood of Jesus, but he declares him the lamb. And throughout Revelations, we see him being revealed as the lamb. Throughout the New Testament, John says, there is the lamb of God. Behold the lamb of God. And what we're seeing is a real clear picture, and everyone knows this, and now you do, but the Jews especially knew he was speaking about the Passover lamb. Now, in the Passover, if you go back to Egypt in the very beginning, before there was a temple, before there was a sacrifice, there was no blood sacrifice, there was no intercession, there was no priesthood, they're just slaves. They're slaves in bondage to Egypt, which represents our bondage to our sin. And here God comes and he brings Moses and he says, let my people go and 10 plagues come. And this, you know how it goes. You go back and read it. And then he comes to the last plague, which is the death of the firstborn. And what he says, in all the land of Egypt, every firstborn will be killed. And the death angel is going to pass through here. And he will look down and there's only one remedy for this. And that is you take the blood of the lamb... That's what he said. You take blood of the lamb, you catch it in a basin, then you take something that seems simple and insignificant, a branch of hyssop, which is just a type of weed kind of that grows in the Middle East. Simple, unbeknowing, not very, you know, amazing. You dip it in the blood and then you apply it to the doorpost of your home. And you apply it to the cross piece God was very specific, and you apply it to the vertical post, but you don't put it on the threshold because you don't want to trample the blood of the lamb. And there he is applying it to the the, the doorpost, and he says, and then you do this because you believe. You believe with all your heart that if you don't do this, you're going to die. The firstborn will die. You believe this because God made you a promise. You believe this because he said, if you will apply the blood and you will go into your home and not come out from under the blood, the death angel will pass over you. That's why it's called Passover. But if you're outside that door, there's death. If the blood is not applied, it's death. Well, but I'm a good Jew, I've been here in Egypt, and I've been serving, and I believe, but you didn't do. You didn't believe what God said. You didn't apply the blood to your household. And I believe that's where many Christians are. Do they believe the Bible, or do they believe in God? Do they believe in Jesus? But they've never applied the blood. Because the blood is in a basin. Putting it in the basin, he could have said, all you got to do is shed the blood, look at the blood, and that's it. No, he says, you got to believe enough to take the time to do what God said to do, to apply it to the cross, peace, and upright. And what this come along is Jesus comes 2,000 years later, and he takes the wondrous cross, and he applies the blood. And you say, well, that's enough. No, I think we have to take it from the basin, take it from the cross and apply our lives to it. And how do you do that? Through the word of your testimony. And that's what we see him saying there. Through that blood, it's done the work, but you got to declare it. You got to believe it, declare it with words of faith. And I share this scripture all the time with you, but I wanted to break it down to show you why I share it in Romans 10 and 8. And it says, the word is near you. And this word, the word word is rhema, which is a spoken word. It means either God has spoken it to us, God's word, or it's what we have spoken and declared. And I believe that the the two components combinations are we take God's word about the blood and the blood saves me the blood cleanses me the blood redeems me Jesus died on that cross his death paid for my sins and I am saved because of him amen see that's testimony that's applying it that's declaring it that's proclaiming it he says the word is near you and actually he says it right here very clearly it's in your mouth Well, what do you mean? It's in our mouth if we say it, 
and it's in your heart, which means you got to believe it in your heart and you got to let it come out of your mouth exactly what you're believing. That's where you overcome Satan. He says, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart. That is the word of faith. Now he puts these two things in the word of faith. And it clearly says, we are what? Proclaiming. We're declaring it. We're saying it. We're not just silently believing it. You know, that's why I think worship is so amazing. When you see worship and you see those words, that's what you're doing. You're declaring with your mouth what God is doing. Amen. What God has done, what he did on that cross. You're declaring it. We're proclaiming it. Verse 9. And then he goes on and really sums it up. And he says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that word there is the Greek word sozo, which means more than just getting in heaven. It means healed, made whole, put together. How many of y'all would like some more of that in your life? Amen. I mean, that's what he's saying. If you start declaring what Jesus' blood has done for you, that's what it means. He's the sinner. You believe it, but you're saying it. For with your heart, you believe and are justified. But it is with your mouth that you confess and are what? How many of y'all want to be saved? How many of y'all want to be saved? Have you declared it with your mouth? And I'm not talking about 10 years ago when you finally made that decision. I'm talking about today. I'm talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about every day of your life declaring, Jesus, you've saved me. You've redeemed me. Your blood has washed me white as snow. You, What you did on that cross is done in my life devil you're a liar amen that's what you start declaring it's with your mouth you're confessing or say that when you do those things that's what you need to do i think i might need to go into this a little more deeper because there's so much more so we'll just see if god lets me do that but the blood of the lamb you believe it you know it and then you apply it to your life by declaring it with your mouth what Jesus has done for you and how he's changed you how his blood has worked in your life and everything that he has done for you and then he says this last statement he says not to love our lives so much as to avoid death I asked the Lord I said well what does that mean Lord is that part of the process to not be afraid of dying or loving our life I think that's probably a whole message But I said, and I feel like it's two parts. One is, it's the results of you understanding the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. And when you do those two things, fear is gone. But I also believe it's the way to walk in it. Because when you walk in fear, faith is weak. Because it's an opposite force. So if Jesus, if you understand the power of the blood of the lamb and what it's done for you, and you're confessing it with your mouth, you're going to get so bold, you're not afraid of anything. You know that you're not afraid of people being against you. You're not afraid of your neighbors and your coworkers and your family persecuting. You're not afraid to go and tell somebody about Jesus. You're not afraid to go and live life. You're not afraid because of fear of dying and plagues and all that you you just lose that fear it's a result and it's a process that you're making those declarations and declaring standing firm in faith and it's applying to your life and you're no longer that person you are overcoming in jesus name amen hebrews 13 5 says i will not be afraid because what can man do to me Oh, there's so many scriptures. God doesn't want you fearful. But if you make your understanding of what Jesus has done and you declare it, the fear is going to go. And if you stand without fear, understanding, declaring, then you're going to overcome. No devil in hell can overcome you because you got the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. That your word is so powerful, it is so rich, it's so deep. We learn day by day, every day it gets clear. you got a plan and you're working the plan. And God, we're going to stand and declare your blood to the world. And we're going to stand with our testimony 
The blood of the Lamb has saved me, washed me, cleansed me. Oh, the power of your blood. And because of that, we're going to not be afraid. We're not going to shrink from death. We're going to boldly go where no man has gone before. Star Trek. Amen. We are going to go out and declare to the world, Jesus is Lord. He's coming again. And let's be ready. And for that, we give you praise. And wherever you are, you don't have that assurance. I want you to believe it, apply the blood, confess it, and keep confessing it, declaring it, and walk boldly in Jesus' name. And you do that from this day forward, and you shall be saved. And that's what I pray for you in Jesus' name. And all the church said, come on, let's give God a big praise. God bless you guys.